following movie will create a structural finite element model that is predominantly hex meshed of an integrally bladed disk. Here you can see we have the cyclic symmetric segment and we'll create our simulation models and we'll begin by idealizing the part in preparation for hex meshing. Here we'll sketch some curves that we'll use to divide the model. Next we'll dimension the curves. Then we'll select the direction to extrude and divide the model. Next we'll continue by splitting the platform and we'll do that with the OML curves of the runout of the blend. And we'll do that down into the platform. Next, we'll trim off the leading and trailing edge of the airfoil by creating some isoparametric curves, which we'll use to drive a surface that we'll use to divide off the leading and trailing edges. So here we'll create our surfaces. And these surfaces are not quite large enough to split off the runout of the blend. So we'd like to make those surfaces larger. So we'll do that by editing these surfaces. Here you can see we have some handles that we can drag if we want, or we can type in values for how much larger we'd like to make the surface. And we'll do the same thing for the trailing edge. Now we can use these surfaces to split the airfoil and the blend. Alright, now our model is prepared for uh, creating our, our mesh, so we'll go into the FEM, we'll turn off uh, the surfaces that we used for dividing the model, and we'll create glue coincident mesh mating conditions. This will ensure a congruent mesh across the multiple bodies that we've created. Here you can see it's automatically identified 20 face pairs for those glue coincident mesh mating conditions. Now to ensure that we can apply uh, symmetric boundary conditions, we're going to put a 2D dependent mesh on the cyclic symmetric faces. Now you'll notice we get an alert saying that uh, there may be some tiny edges that we should take care of before we try and create this mesh. And here you can see both of them. Let's go ahead and cancel the 2D dependent mesh command and we'll go ahead and merge those faces to get rid of those tiny, uh, tiny edges on the cyclic symmetric faces. All right, so now when we create our symmetric 2D dependent mesh, we won't get the alert. There's no tiny edges found, that's good. Uh, let's make sure that the match loops edges 
are correct and correspond, then we'll define a reference coordinate system in the cylindrical frame. and create a quadrilateral mesh on the faces that we will not export to the solver. This is a seed mesh only that we'll use in just a moment when we create our hex mesh. So we'll do the same thing to the platform cyclic symmetric faces, ensuring that our match loops edges correspond Then we'll go ahead and select the same cylindrical uh, coordinate system that we defined on our previous mesh and create the same four noted quadrilateral mesh at the same global element size. So here you can see our meshes in the various collectors. Now we'll create a three noted triangular symmetric 2D dependent mesh on the transition layer between the platform and the disk portion of the model. All right, so that looks good. Go ahead and just hide our connection collectors for the mesh mating conditions. And we'll begin by hex meshing the, uh, the blend. So here we can assign a source element size, and you can see it creates a swept mesh through the blend. Now, let's say that we really wanted at least four elements through the thickness of the blade. Let's go ahead and put a mesh control that will tell it that we want four elements through the thickness and then update our mesh. All right, now that we're happy with that, we'll continue by putting a hex mesh on the airfoil. And we'll make sure that we put that into the same collector because the part is going to be made out of the same material. All of these bodies will be made out of the same material. Now for the leading edge, I think we could do a little bit better in terms of the uh, mesh. So what we'll do is we'll create a 2D uh, seed mesh where we'll tell it that we don't want any triangles on the leading edge. And while that looks a little bit better, we can do even better if we control the number of elements in the various locations. So let's say we only want two on these edges and one on those. And that looks exactly like what we want. So now since that 2D seed mesh is on that face when we go to create our sweat mesh, it will use that as its starting point for sweeping. Now here you can see we'll, we'll do the same thing here. Now as an option, you may have noticed that the uh, sweat mesh command has a, uh, the ability to attempt quad only. And we could try this. However, I think what you'll see is that the 2D seed mesh gives uh, much greater control over how that mesh is created. So here if we do zero triangles, we'll get zero triangles, but not the mesh that we wanted. And I think I just undid one step too far. Let's go ahead and put that sweat mesh back in. And then we'll put on our zero triangles seed mesh and sweep. All 
All right, that looks good. Let's go ahead and sweep the platform. And also the disk. And for the remaining bodies, we're going to put on a 10-noted tetrahedral mesh that will transition to the hex meshes with pyramid elements. And we'll put those meshes into the same collector so that it will have the same material assigned as well. All right, if we want to take a look at the pyramid transitions, we can just show those. And it looks like we have the 2D meshes on as well. We can turn those off. So there you can see all of our pyramid transition elements. All right, now that we've completed our mesh, what we'll do is continue by assigning some constraints and some loads to our model. So we'll do that in the sim. And here we'll create a couple degree of freedom between the cyclic symmetric faces. Since we had put our 2D dependent mesh on the cyclic symmetric faces, we can very quickly and easily create the coupling because of the nodes that match on the cyclic symmetric faces. So here you can see the couplings. If we want, we can adjust the display to make them a little bit smaller. And you can see how it's coupled the mid nodes there for the tetrahedral regions of the, the model. Next we'll assign a centrifugal load. And here with NX we have the ability to put loads and constraints in in whatever unit system we're comfortable. So there I can put it in as 4000 RPM as opposed to degrees per second. Next we'll apply our arrow loads to the airfoil faces and we'll select those faces using a tangent faces option. This will help accelerate some of the face selections. All right, now that we have the faces selected that we want to apply our arrow loads to, we have a field that defines the arrow loads as a function of x, y, z. And I have that in a comma-separated file that we'll go ahead and import. So here you can see the x, y, z, and pressure. We can go ahead and interpolate that data onto our structural mesh. And then we can view the contours of that applied pressure. All right, that looks good. Let's continue by creating a user-defined constraint on one of the faces of our model. And we'd like to constrain only the theta and z direction on this face, excluding the edges that already have a couple degrees of freedom defined on them. So here we've selected our displacement coordinate system as the cylindrical one, and we'll constrain DOF 2 and 3, which corresponds to theta and z. All right, now we may be ready to solve, but we have a nice model setup check here that will check the model to ensure that we haven't forgotten anything critical to allowing the model to solve. So here you can see the model setup check has come across something that we've missed. No materials have been found in the model. Here you can see a list of the errors and a suggestion for how to correct it. So let's go ahead and take that suggestion and apply a material to our model. Here we'll go ahead and pull one out of the material library.
All right, now that we've applied the material, I think that was the only error that we had in our model setup check, but we'll keep that toggled on in case we missed anything else. All right, uh, since it didn't find anything else, it started Nastran. I'll go ahead and pause the video. Um, and the, uh, the solution takes all of uh, about 50 seconds. And here you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of the solution monitor uh, the total time for the solution. And then we can go ahead and view our results. We can look at uh, the displacement and animate the displacement. See how those arrow loads are deflecting the, the airfoil. And we can also take a look at the stress results. And we can also adjust uh, the stress results by averaging and whether or not we want to include internal elements or mid nodes. There's many options for being able to adjust how you can post process your results. All right, now where the real power of SimCenter comes in is let's say we have a design change that we need to make. Let's go and make a design change to our airfoil platform blend. So let's say the quarter inch blend isn't big enough. We need a little bit bigger blend. Let's make it 0.3 instead. Now you can see we're almost running out over the edge of our model here and our platform. You can see all of the work that we did has been updated for defining our partitions in the idealized part. Next we'll go to the finite element model. You can see that the geometry has updated. Now all we need to do is hit the update finite element model button and it will update the mesh to correspond to the updated geometry of the larger blend. Now that we've updated our finite element model, we can go to our solution where we've applied our loads and boundary conditions, all of which have remained associative and consistent on the faces where they were defined. Let's go ahead and clone the solution so we have another copy of it. We can preserve our original results and solve for the updated model. And now in another 48 seconds, we have our updated results. And we can view those. We can view them side by side with our original. So here we'll bring up our stress results from our original model, can synchronize the views so that when we rotate or zoom on one, it does the same to the other. Here we can turn on our annotations, we can see where our maximum result is. And you can see how by changing the size of the blend that the location of maximum stress has shifted. And that concludes the demonstration.